What's the score? We're up 3-2. What's the score? We're up 3-2. Score? We're up 3-2. All right. You're watching Indians baseball from Jacob's Field on Sports Channel tonight. We're up 3 2. <laughs> Swing and a miss, strike two. What was that? Guy's a real jerk. Sports Channel, bringing you the teams that bring us together. I really do think there's something magical here because at the other stadium it wasn't like that. Well hit to right center field. Back is Tinsley to the warning track. To the wall. It's gone. Home run and the Indians win. There's no question about it. It's got the Lord's countenance on it. You know what I'm saying? I don't care what religion you are. If you believe in a higher being, it's right here. Line to center field. Back is Edmonds. To the warning track. To the wall. It's gone. A grand slam home run. Continue. Sometimes we lose sight of the fact that when you have a big crowd, and there are always big crowds here at Jacobs Field, uh, it, it, it pumps up the ball plays. It, it makes the adrenaline flow. Oh, That's a drive to deep right field. That ball is back. That ball is gone. Jim Tommy wins it for the Indians. I think it's a blessing. It's a blessing from the Lord. This is a team of destiny. There's no question about it. Long drive, deep right field. There is something magical. They've had so many come from behind wins, and I've never in my entire life seen or played with a team that hit so many home runs to end the game. Manny Ramirez, a two-out, two-run home run in the bottom of the 12th inning. Oh, wow. The magic is back at Jacobs Field. Wahoo, what a finish. 12 magical moments at Jacobs Field. The sun dawned on a new day in Cleveland. Opening day, 1994. A new ballpark, Jacobs Field, a new attitude, and a visit from the nation's top left-hander. Actually, I was a little nervous. Thinking, well, I just warmed up for 15 minutes, but now I put on this big bulky baseball jacket, and what if I blow it? So what I did was to um, take a deep breath. I looked down there at Alomar, who's the catcher. He's really a big man. I thought, I can hit him. He's, he's six foot six or something, you know. I cheated a little bit. I threw the ball a little higher and slower than I would if I were actually out there playing to make sure it got there without being on the ground and in the strike zone. But Seattle's top left-hander threw just a little harder, holding the Indians hitless through seven. Finally, in the 11th, with a game tied at three, Wayne Kirby. Head down the left field line, the Indians have won it. Wayne Kirby has made the debut of Jacobs Field complete. That game was so important to this club. One, we felt we had a club that was ready to break through, and I think two, moving into our new ballpark and setting our own turf, that uh, we were going to be a tough club to beat. I think that propelled us. Uh, obviously towards a, a quality 94 season and, uh, and I think uh, that was the first step that got our guys believing that uh, the extra innings belonged to the Indians. That opening day victory set a tone in 94, one that continued throughout the year. Fired a running, fly ball hit well to left field. Back is Vaughn to the warning track to the wall, it's gone! Albert Bell with a two-run home run wins it for the Indians in the bottom half of the 13th inning. Fly ball, right field and deep. This ball game is over. Bell drives it toward right center field, way back to the wall. It's up, it's gone, the Indians win. Bell with a base hit in the left center field. It'll drop, the one run scored. Here comes Fiaga, here comes the throw. The Indians win. Unbelievable. The Indians win again. Three runs in the bottom of the ninth inning. This is amazing. 
this year it seems like we've just taken over where we left off and um, you know the fans have been a great influence on us you know I think that really shows up and uh, all our late inning wins you know we've uh, had a lot of comeback victories and um, I think it's a little tribute to the fans you know they could have headed toward the turnstiles a lot of times and uh, they end up sticking around and give you a little uh, boost of confidence and it seems to really help especially in the late innings. Those late inning heroics spawned a new celebration Cleveland called its own. One that's definitely over the top. When you get to win and hit, you just get, get ready to get pounded on top of the helmet. Your guy's going to pound you. It all started last year. Uh, we start hitting, you know, slowly. And then uh, the next time we start hitting a little bit harder. Uh, it came out to get crazy and wild. All the guys know what's going on, and everybody expects to get hit hard. And there's the standard greeting for a hero here in Cleveland. <laughs> you know what? It started last year, I think, with Jim Tomey and those guys. Jim Tomey or whatever. He's one of the biggest heads on the team. <laughs> Jim Tomey. Jim Tomey started everything. He started hitting everybody. You have to get be careful with him. He don't know how strong he is. Somebody's going to get hurt one day, you know, if we keep doing it. Let's see if they do the head slam in the night. You know, that drilling so high, I, I think that you didn't even feel what's going on. Well, you just get a headache. <laughs> First of all, you better expect to have a headache the next day. I had a headache after that. And he is mobbed by his teammates at home play. Eddie Murray, he got mad because I hit him kind of hard, because I was trying to ease up and hit him, and he moved his head, and I had to you know, swap him pretty good, and he didn't like that, but oh well. Manny Ramirez went to hit somebody on the head, and he caught me with an elbow, like on my cheek, and I was like, Jeez, everybody gets hurt in this thing. And now once a guy hits a home run, I think he's dreading really to uh, get to home plate. It's better not to hit the guy. You can hurt yourself if the way we punt it. <laughs> so I think if I do it, I'm going to run, touch home plate, and scatter around and leave everyone else. They have to chase me. Yeah, I would put myself in that situation any time to wake up with a headache. And, you know, hopefully uh, we'll have a lot more beatings at home plate later on this season. <laughs> They're beating him up at home plate. <laughs> Of course, with close to 3 million fans at Jacobs Field, there's always electricity in the air. Home or away, the Indians were amazing. They won more than 25 games in their last at bat, more than 15 of those at home. Here then are the 12 most dramatic finishes at Jacobs Field in 1995. The thing that, that really drew me to Carlos the first time I saw him, and the first time I saw him was in uh, the Pacific Coast League in 1989. He was playing third base for the uh, Las Vegas Stars, who are the Padres' uh, AAA club. And I was managing Colorado Springs, um, and, and I, the thing that drew me to him, other than his obvious physical talent, was that the way he absolutely enjoyed playing the game, and he didn't mind showing everybody enjoyed it. There's so many things that he does that, that you, when he does them, you, you just think, yeah, I can't believe he did that. Uh, he's, he's a tremendous talent, swings the bat very, very well. He's a smart player, and he's a winner. It was a cold night in Cleveland. Kansas City led 2-1 to one in the ninth. Wayne Kirby got the chance to test his pinch-hitting philosophy. I'm be sitting on the bench, and it's cold, sometimes raining, and uh, you have to come off and, you know, keep an uh, uh, inning going. It's a tough situation when you, when you have to face the stoppers, and you're sitting on the bench, and uh, Jeff Montgomery, he was just throwing me all breaking balls, and I uh, happened to get one hanging and hit it through the hole. Through the right side of base hit. Here comes Amaro. Here comes Coleman. No play to the plate. The ball game is tied. Kirby comes through. Base hit to right. It's 2-2. When you do that, it's, it's well worth it. A lot of guys don't like to do it, but somebody got to do it. <laughs> On to extra innings, where the Royals fell under the spell of Jacobs Field. Runners going, pitch out, call for, throw to second. He got it. This Cal bare hands, throw to the guy. What a play. The inning is over. The Indians go to work in the bottom of the 10th. Pitching and defense had done their job for the tribe. Now it was time for the magic of the offense led by Carlos Baerga. Baerga with a drive toward right field. On the 
move is Coleman. The ball is off the wall. Bayerga around first, on his way to second. He's there with a stand-up double to lead off the inning. A bid for a home run just short, but Bayerga's double has him at second base with nobody out. And I think the money come up and hit a base hit to center field, and I just tried to score. The pitch. A swing and a line drive, base hit to center. When I slide home play, I try to strike pretty hard, you know, to, to make a pop border, you know, to drop the ball. Bayerga around third. Goodwin charges. Throw to the plate. Bayerga. The slide. Safe. The drive is won. When I see the ball down, you know, I was more happy there than ever. The Jacobs Field magic is back. The Indians pull it out. One in the ninth to tie, one in the tenth to win. Manny is, a, a, for a young hitter, is a very intelligent hitter. Manny came into my office uh, last night after a ball game, and, and, and he was struggling with a little bit of stuff. And Manny has never come into my office before, but he, but he comes in and, and closes the door and grabs a bat and starts talking to me about hitting and about what he thinks he's doing wrong. And I sit there and watch him, and I said, yeah, he's, got a, he's got a good handle on that, because that's exactly what he's doing wrong. And we, and we spent 30 minutes talking about steps to, to correct that. And, but that's the type of hitter that Manny is. He's very cognizant of, of what he does at the plate. He has a chance to be as good as there ever has been in this game, I believe. That the Boston Red Sox were in first place was a surprise to many. Even more so was Tim Wakefield their budding Cy Young candidate, whose knuckleball this day had the Indians flailing away. Cleveland starter Dennis Martinez was not as fortunate and fell behind early, three to nothing. But then the momentum began to shift. That'll drop for a hit. They'll wave the runner around. Here comes Greenwell. Here comes Bell short of the plate. They got him. Boston led 3-1 when Wakefield in the fourth knuckled under to Jim Tomey. Tomey, high fly ball, well hit, deep to right center field. Back is Tinsley, and warning track, it's gone. Jim Tomey, number 15. It's the first home run this year given up by Wakefield, and Tomey made sure it was no cheapy. One inning later, Tim gave up his second. Two balls and one strike. Bell, high fly ball, deep left field. Back is Greenwell to the warning track to the wall. It's gone. High ball game, 3-3. Three, three. Still 3-3 three, three when Ramirez faced Boston closer Ken Ryan. And Ramirez struck out looking with a winning run on second base. It was a lesson learned. I was uh, pulling off of the ball, you know. Right. And I said to Dennis Martinez, you know, I have to be tough in this game, you know. I'm going, I'm going to get him. Ramirez was called out on strike to the runner second and nobody out in the eighth inning. You know, I think he made good pitches against me in the last at bat. That was a straight back. A good battle now. Well, you know, I was trying to go to the middle on him in my last at bat. Three and two, bottom half of the tenth. Nobody out. Three, three ball game. Well hit to right center field, back is Kinsley to the warning track, to the wall, it's gone! Home run and the Indians win! The magic is still here at Jacobs Field. Jim Tomey really personifies a lot of what um, young players should aspire to be. I mean, this is a young man that's come through the system, he was not a high draft pick. Uh, he's worked very hard at his game. Uh, he's blessed with inordinate uh, power and, and skills, but he has really worked hard at his game. And I think he's become very popular because of his accessibility, because of his work ethic, and also his talent. Sparky Anderson watched his 2 to nothing deficit change in a sweet second. There's a drive to right field, a goodbye. Lou Whitaker having some night. Hits it in the lower deck, and we have a tie game. So it remained into the ninth, when, with Cleveland threatening, one of the more confusing plays of the year took place. Base is loaded, one out, ninth inning. Line drive right at the third baseman, and one out, throw home. Now what are they ruling? Wait a minute. Wait a minute here. Well, he dropped the ball at third. He dropped the ball at third. What is going on? I don't know. Yeah, no, none of the umpires are making a ruling. Ty 
Boyega is saying a double play. Carlos Boyega is coming home and touches home plate. And now what's going on? There are four umpires out there. They're all standing. I'd like to tell you what's happening, but I can't. Out at third, out at second. An inning-ending double play. One that simply delayed the inevitable. Jim Tomey leads off the bottom of the 10th inning. Game tied at two. Maxi the wind, the pitch, and Tomey driven off the plate ball one. He misses low to Tomey, and the count goes 2-0. Oh. The wind and the pitch. And he misses low and inside to Tomey. 3-0 and oh the count as Jim looks directly into the Indians' dugout to see if he has the green light. I knew I was going to get a pretty good pitch to hit, not as good as what I got, but I was trying to drive the ball out of the park and win the game and was fortunate to get a real good pitch to do it. The 3-0 pitch. Tomey belts it! Deep right! Way back! Gone! The Indians have done it again! The Indians win for the seventh time this year, their last at-bat, the fifth time on this homestand. <laughs> Jose just stepped up, you know, they gave him the ball and, um, you know, every time he comes out, especially when we get a lead, we pretty much know the game's over. Um, I think he's been our MVP all year. Um, to come in and be so consistent day in and day out, it's really hard to do in baseball. And, uh, you know, when he comes into the game, it just seems like uh, it's over with. It's just a matter of time. A first inning home run by Albert Bell gave Cleveland a 2-1 lead over Milwaukee. And Manny Ramirez made it 3-2 in the second. But the Brewers battled back and rallied to take a 5-3 lead in the eighth inning. Then, in the bottom of the eighth inning, after a leadoff triple put by Erga on third, good things began to happen. The short and the plate. Set and pitch. And that is low ball four, so the bases are loaded. With one down, Manny Ramirez flew out to shallow right. And holding at third, Bayerga. Still five to three in the eighth. And so now two men out, and it'll be up to Paul Sorrento. And Sorrento trying to break out of an 0 for 18 skip. Good time to do it. I was scuffling for a long time, and uh, it was one of those balls where I hit down the right field line and it happened to hit right on the line. And the pitch, swung on line down the right field line, hooking, a fair ball, two runs in. Here comes the runner, Tommy, they'll stop him at third base. And the Indians have tied the game. We could not see where that ball landed, but it had to be almost right on the foul line. Big blow for Paul Sorrento. You know, just happened to get a break. You know, the ball could have been fair or foul and ended up being fair. And, uh, you know, it was a good situation. We ended up tying the game. And then I think uh, Wayne came up the next batter. Rob Dibble comes on for the Milwaukee Brewers. And Wayne Kirby will pinch hit. Oh, he's still on Dibble. Everyone knows. And he's still got the temper. He's still got, a, got his fastball. I think he lost a little bit on his fastball. But uh, basically, that's the type of pitcher I hit well. Hard thrower, so. Um, I was ready for that, too. <laughs> and the next pitch. And a little fly ball dropping in the center field of the base hit. One run home. Here comes Sorrento. Two runs. And the Indians lead it 7-5. to five. Wayne Kirby comes through with a pinch hit single, driving in a pair. The Indians have scored four times here in the eighth inning. Talk about a clutch hit. That is a big one. Kirby had come through with his bat. Now he sought to come home with his speed. Kirby racing for third. That'll be a stolen base and an error. Uh, the Indians stirring it up here in the eighth inning. Ground ball right side. That's going to go through a base hit. And the Indians lead it eight to five. Nice piece of hitting by Omar. He just went the other way with it. An eight to five lead confidently turned over to Jose Mesa, looking for a slice of history. Long standing ovation and a rousing welcome for Jose Mesa, who tries to set a new Major League record with his 37th consecutive save without a blown save. 
but the tribe's sudden turnaround made for a challenging save situation. Those are probably some of the tough, toughest kinds of saves because, because your closer doesn't have a chance to get himself mentally ready for that situation. In scoring uh, those five runs, it, it doesn't, first of all, it doesn't give you much time to get him up and get him loose. I, I don't think Jose was, but I was, uh, I was a little, I was scared to death. <laughs> Ace is ready. Here's his pitch. Ground ball, second base side. Carlos Baig in front of it, has it. Throws, the game is over. Jose Mesa has a new major league record as he has saved his 37th game in a row without a blown save. Kenny Lofton is the, is the one player we have that can completely dominate a game. Um, he can hit the ball out of the ballpark. He can bunt and steal two bases and score on an infield hit. Uh, and I think, obviously, uh, his defense is, uh, is a joy to watch. I mean, you pay money just to watch Kenny play center field. It's a very special, special athlete. But against Minnesota, Kenny's heroics would have to wait, as this game began in typical Eddie Murray fashion. <laughs> with a first inning RBI single that gave Cleveland a one to nothing lead. But it was Murray's next at bat in the third inning that all but put Cleveland fans over the edge. There's a drive toward right field. It's off the wall. One run is in. Two runs are in. The Indians have a 4-2 lead and Murray has three runs batted in. Almost got it out of here. Yeah, I thought that might have got above that yellow line but that's what Mike Hargrove is going to go out and argue. Other than that they were just crazier than that. <laughs> Umpires are honest, and they are. They do right, try to make the right call, even though sometimes I think we all think maybe that they don't. Now the fans are all getting irate. Home run, home run. Yes, it is. That's the call. They conferred, made the call. He'll try it on home. Eddie Murray with his third of the year. Well, just give him one more RBI and tack on that home run. The Twins would fall behind 8-3 before a five-run seventh tied the score. Then, in the eighth... Fastball hit high and deep to left field. Bell is back to the warning track of the ball. It is gone. Home run, and the Minnesota Twins have the lead 9-8. But Eddie Murray's merry day was not yet over. There's a drive, deep right field. Puckett is back to the warning track to the wall. Two home runs, five RBIs, and the Indians right back to tie this one. What a game. What a game indeed. One that was, in fact, just beginning. For with the score tied at nine, these two teams played on, and on, and on, and on. We are headed to overtime at Jacobs Field this afternoon. Bouncing ball to short. They come to the plate. The throw is there. The tag is out. This ball game now will be five plus hours in length. Sorrento cuts it off. That will save a run and gets an out at first. Fair ball. Diving for the final out of the inning. Good play by Tommy. For the third time in the game, the Twins leave the bases loaded. Mark Wiley calling to see if there's anyone left in the bullpen. Ball game approaching the five and a half hour mark. A long day for Tom Kelly and Mike Cargrove, pushing all the buttons. And all the strategizing has been done, you know, up to that point. That's that's your last, that's your last gasp. Well, I'll tell you, the folks who came to the ballpark today pretty much got to see the entire pitching staff. Yes, they did. And most of the position players for both teams. Called strike three. He strikes out the side. Longest game in length at Jacobs Field, five hours, 41 minutes. Chopper off the plate. Baerga comes to the plate. They get him. They got him. Second time in the ball game. We are in some uncharted waters right now, heading for what could be the longest game in Indians history. To third. Tommy backhands. Goes to second for one. On the first double play. Five, four, three around the horn. The Indians escape. 
the toughest part is trying to stay focused mentally because the game has been dragging on. We've had 42 hits in the ball game, two errors, 18 runs, thousands of pitches. <laughs> like I said, after a while, I just started to get kind of kind of dead because you've been out there for so long, you just want to get it over with. Well, he's down at the other end of the dugout now. He's trying to change things around. You do silly things, and it was a silly thing. thing. You know, you, I thought, well, I'm, I've been down at this end of the dugout for 17 innings, and we have not scored yet, or 16 innings. So I'm going to move down to the other end of the dugout and, and, and see if that helps. And of course, we won, and that's the reason we won, is because I moved. <laughs> this is now the longest game time-wise in Indians history. Lofton is the batter. There's one out, the winning run at third. And I said, well, I'm going to just try to hit this ball right, you know, right back up the middle, and basically that's what I did. Lofton up the middle in the center field, a base hit. It is finally over. The longest game in Indians history. The Indians win it in the bottom of the 17th, 10 to 9. After 396 minutes and 580 pitches, victory and sleep were at hand. I was, I was so tired, I just ran straight to the clubhouse and just got in a shower and a laugh and went home. Mike Cargo said, finally, I got down to the other end of the dugout. They win it and there's the reaction. You have people on your ball club, you want to see them all do well, but, you, but, but, but there are, are certain players on your ball club that you get a certain special satisfaction out of seeing them do well. <clears throat> and Sandy really is one of those guys for me because of all he's had to overcome really since 1990 with all the injuries that he's had. And they've all been legitimate injuries that have cost him time. And, and I know that Sandy has such a desire to compete and, and, and uh, succeed and that he gives back probably to the fans more than any other player on our ball club. 29 years old today, Albert Bell. Look out, here's number two off Albert Bell's bat. The man's got style, it's his birthday, and he means to celebrate. The sellout crowd also celebrated Albert's two birthday bombs, but one fan was still thinking about a pregame chat he had with Sandy Alomar. There was a little kid that was his dad. He just finished him burying his dad, and uh, from, uh, from a car crash. And uh, uh, I, I was I was struggling at the moment. And uh, he came up to me and said, "You know, you're my favorite player. Would you hit a home run for me?" And uh, I told him that he was a man and he was going to hit a home run that night. And he said, "Okay, I guess." I haven't hit one for a while, and I told him he was due. Sandy didn't homer in the bottom of the seventh, but his leadoff single did ignite a rally one that would give the Indians a 5-3 lead following Carlos Baerga's two-run double. Cleveland maintained that lead into the ninth, where with senior slam on the mound, it appeared that Alomar's predicted home run would simply not happen. But that's precisely when some reverse Jacobs Field magic transpired. Pat Curtis stands in. First pitch fly ball right field. Back goes Ramirez, still going back at the wall. That ball is gone. A home run for Chad Curtis. And this game is all tied up, and that breaks the string of consecutive saves for Jose Mesa. But it also allowed for an unexpected 11th inning at bat by Alomar. And a young fan's wish fulfilled. Wind and the pitch. As a drive to left, way back, it's at the fence, it's gone, this game is over. Sandy Alomar wins it in the 11th. I was just like, wow, that was pretty cool. I was like, well, I wonder if he still remembers that I told him to do it or if he just hit it. I was very shocked that when I had the home run, I just ran the bases and the first thing that came into my mind, I got to shake this kid's hand or point to him or it's for you and... Uh... Then after he'd hit it, he handed the bat to me over the wall and then I was escorted up to the locker room and he signed it for me. Something very special, I gave him the home run bat, autograph for him, he was very pleased with that. Yeah, that hasn't happened since the Babe did that or Lou Gehrig or any of the Yankees, so yeah, I thought about that a little bit. Oh, I'm not the Babe, <laughs> not even close to it, but uh, uh, you know, I'm happy I can make some kids uh, happy and uh, 
it was a great it was a great feeling for myself and uh, for the whole atmosphere of the ball club and for, especially for the kid. I think that's one of the great things about baseball, and that's one I think of the great things about a, a player like Sandy Alomar, and specifically Sandy. He's a very accessible player. Things like that mean something to Sandy. For him to walk up and take his turn. Uh, at a, a dramatic finish, especially with those circumstances, was uh, very special. It's like there's a, there's a thought when he comes up to the plate, not only with the team, but in the crowd. They sense when Albert comes up, they ring that bell, and these people are going crazy in the stands. They're waiting for it. And they, it's almost to a point now where they're expecting it to happen. And it has a lot. It's happened three times this year for him. Game number six against the Blue Jays was another marathon. This one, 14 innings. But it gave the Indians an opportunity to lay on the leather and prove once again they were more than just a bunch of booming bats. Pascal vacuums and gets it. The first base for Perry. Sharply hit. Could be two, yes. Double play for the Indians. Oh, they've got Alomar hung up. But he will not go quietly. Finally, they nail him. Cleveland's defense held the fort until the top of the 14th inning. Game deadlock. Here in the 14th, Mike Huff to the plate. Pitch to Huff. A swing and a fly ball hit to center. This will be deep enough. Lofton still going back, makes the over-the-shoulder catch in front of the track. Tagging and scoring the go-ahead run is Robbie Alomar, and Mike Huff delivers a sack fly to deep center. In that situation, you're looking to tie the game up and keep going. And with Kenny leading off, uh, you're looking for him to get on and, and, and really either sacrifice him over or him steal the base. The ideal thing is if he hits a double, and that's what he did against the left-hander, hit the ball down the left field line. End of the motion, 1-2 offering. A swing and a looper hit over the head of the third baseman down the left field line. Around first, Lofton digs for second. Carter's throw, not in time. Stand up double. The pitch, Fiscal bunts to the left of the mound. Castillo looks to third, throws to first in time as Alomar takes the throw. And now the tying run 90 feet from home and Carlos Baerga coming to the plate. The pitch. A swing and a fly ball hit to left field. This should be deep enough. Carter waiting in medium deep left makes the catch. Here comes Lofton. The throw to the plate is cut off. We are tied at three. Now can Albert Bell win it? Lifetime against Castillo. Bell two for three. I figured he'd try to throw at least four balls and just, you know, walk me and, um, you know, maybe pitch to Eddie or something. But I would just told myself, I'm just swinging. I mean, I don't care where the balls are. A swing and a pop foul to the upper deck right side. Strike one. The first pitch was, I think, over my head and fouled that off. And um, he threw a couple other ones um, around the strike zone. And then that next pitch was a little lower than the first pitch. And uh, I was able to, to get it up in the uh, in the wind current and kind of just floated out in the, in the left center. A swing and a drive to deep left center. Way back. It is gone. in the 14th on Albert Bell's 32nd home run, and he is being mobbed at home plate. I don't know of many people that could have hit the pitch that he hit and hit it as far as he hit it. He hit it more to left center field than he did straight away left field. And, and with that, you know, with the, the wall out there, the 19-foot wall, and, and to hit it, uh, and the ball was up and away from him, and I don't know how he got to it. But he did and, and, and hit it out. I mean, I love Albert Bell at the play. He's the most focused hitter, the most prepared hitter I've ever seen. And uh, he's especially dangerous uh, in key situations. And, uh, and I think he's especially dangerous with men on base. Um, I go back to uh, many times uh, over the, the years that I've, Albert and I have been together uh, and, and have seen him just do things that other players can't do. He has, uh, he has great power and he has the ability to, to break a game open. 
The very next night, the Alomars met again, and this time Roberto's Blue Jays held a 4-3 lead in the ninth. While Sandy's fans urged him and the tribe to get back on the beaten path. Here is Manny Ramirez, 0 for 2 of the walk. 3-2 pitch. Ground ball through the right side, a base hit. I should say through the left side. So Manny Ramirez gets the Indians going in the ninth. And here comes Sandy Alomar. Alomar laced a double down the left field line, sending pinch runner Wayne Kirby to third. Going to second base is Alomar. And the Indians with nobody out in the ninth inning have runners at second and at third. One out later, the stage was set for the first pinch hitting appearance of the year by Carlos Baerga. He delivers. Fly ball deep enough to center field to get the run home. Waiting his hoof, he makes the catch, hit the tag. The throw will go to third base, and the Indians have tied it here in the ninth. Sacrifice fly from Carlos Baerga. The score remained tied, and for the second straight night, the game went into extra innings. Tomey reached first with a one-out walk, and Albert Bell now faced a pitcher he had never faced before, Toronto reliever Jimmy Rogers. They brought in a new guy, and I was just, you know, trying to swing at the strikes. Um, you know, I saw where he was warming up through a fast slot and a curve, and, you know, I figured I had to get, you know, one of those three pitches to hit. The pitch. Breaking ball low and away, ball one. First pitch curveball down and away, and then he came back, and... He threw a slider. I don't think he was expecting me to, to swing at that. 1-0 pitch, a swing and a pop-up behind home plate, but this will become a souvenir. You know, I felt like that was a, um, a pretty good pitch um, to handle to hit out the ballpark. At, and the, uh, the next pitch, uh, it was a fastball up and in. I think he wanted it up and in a little bit further, but, um, uh, you know, it, it stayed out of the plate. I mean, it was a, it was a tough pitch to handle, and... and uh, you know, I kept it fair. The one-to-one -one offering. Bell lines one to deep left. Goodbye to the home run porch. Albert Bell for the second night in a row with a game-winning home run. This time a two-run shot down the left field line. And once again, a home plate celebration as the Indians in 10 innings have beaten the Toronto Blue Jays 6-4 to four on Bell's 33rd home run. I've been struggling against the Blue Jays this year. I know last year I uh, came up with some, some big home runs in the late innings off of them, but um, this year I was, I was struggling. So I think our teammates might have been a little shocked that it happened uh, two days in a row. Well, Albert's been awfully clutch, I, you know, over the years, not just this year and not just last year. He, he's, you know, he hits number four for a reason. He has that, that type of talent and that, that type of abilities. I do the things that I do because it's what I was taught and it's how I approach it um, and what I believe is right. Uh, Eddie Murray was my first chance of seeing how it was supposed to be done. I mean, why is it important for you to play in every single game? Why is it important for your team to be out there every day? And all you had to do was look over at first base and see that's why it's important. Game number four was preceded by a pregame prediction to Eddie Murray from Tony Pena. As I said, you know, it's about time that you hit a home run to win the ball game. I, I said it before the game. But for Eddie to live up to Tony's premonition, he'd have to deal with pain. He was batting right-handed against Milwaukee left-hander Scott Carl. He's been scuffling since coming off the disabled list on August 1st. He missed a month with two fractured ribs. He still has soreness when batting right-handed. Not often will he face a left-hander. Check swing and fouled off. He just goes out and leads by example, and I think the other players see him playing when he's hurt. Last year he played with the bad thumb all year. This year he had to go on and disable us with the, with, the, with the bad ribs, but he came back faster than anybody thought he would. He has just been a, a great player and a great example. That is hit hard, but not deep enough. Straightaway center, Bell will tag. He'll try to test the arm of Pulse. In safely. In his next at bat, Eddie grounded out five to four to three, again right-handed. Still, the Indians led three to two. 
In Eddie's third at bat, right-handed again, he came close to proving Pena a profit. Eddie Murray at the plate, 0 for 2. One down, a runner at second. Hit to deep left. If it's fair, it could be trouble, but it'll hook foul. Hit it off the end of the bat. A bittersweet souvenir for a fan, but more pain for the man. As a few pitches later, Eddie sorely tested those ribs on a changeup. With the game now tied at three, Eddie finally caught a break as he got to bat left-handed against Milwaukee reliever Bill Wegman. I can remember when he said um, from the right side his ribs were hurting. So he, um, he was happy to see a right-hand pitcher come in in that situation. Lifetime Eddie Murray batting 345 against Bill Wegman. 3-3 time, bottom of the night. Murray with a deep drive to right. This ball is gone. How many times do they do it? It's unbelievable. And what a fun run that must be to travel the bases knowing you have just won the ball game in the bottom of the ninth inning. You know, it was one of those things. Tony Pena made a prediction before the game started that I was going to hit a home run. I looked at him, and everybody else did, and I guess I kept him waiting a while. This ball club this year, you know, is so united, you know, and uh, you can see everybody pull for each other. You can see everybody try to help each other, and uh, it's something that's real valuable for a ball club, especially when the ball club is contended and has so much talent like the ball club we have. It all started last year. They had such a great year, uh, played so well here at Jacobs Field. Um, they came in on a mission, I think, in spring training, and these guys believed. They, I think they got over the hurdle of believing they can win. They knew they could win, and they just uh, started from day one. They've been incredible. Um, they know they can hit. They're very confident. They're not a cocky bunch of guys. Uh, they have a lot of belief in themselves. And, you know, I, I saw them come back from 8 to nothing here against Cy Young winner of last year. So. Um, they know they can do it against anybody. It's just it's just a matter if they have enough time. Rubber game of the series. The Indians trying to make it two out of three over the Jays. Behind the pitching of Jason Grimsley this afternoon, who will make his second consecutive start. Unfortunately for Grimsley, it was a very brief start. Pulls it to short. A base hit. One run is in. Two runs will score. Molitor to third on the play. And the Indians are in a hole. There's a base hit, another run scores. Carter will stop at second as Monitor scores. 3 0, still nobody out. There's a drive to center field. Back is Kenny Lofton near the warning track, close to the wall. Looks up, it's gone. Three run homer. 6 0, Toronto. The Blue Jays scored seven in the first and eventually went up 8 to nothing. Not the most promising scenario against one of baseball's best pitchers. Well, it wasn't a good feeling because uh, I think Cohn was on the mound and uh, it was 7 nothing. You might as well bet the mortgage that uh, we ain't coming back, you know, especially on a quality pitcher like uh, Cohn. Sky to shallow left. And it drops for a hit. The Indians will get a run. That's a base hit into left center field. Toby and Sorrento score. The sellout crowd finally makes some noise. Most people say that offense is contagious in baseball, but for the Indians, they take it to another level. We have so many guys that have high averages plus power so that we can come back so quickly. It's a, a walk, a hit, and all of a sudden a bomb, and we're back in the game. Here's a fly ball, deep right field. Way back toward the bullpen. That ball is up and gone. The Indians climb back. It's now 8-5. to five. The relentless Indians then made it 8-6 to six to set up still another fantastic finish. And the fans now trying to rally the troops. Let's see if that Jacobs magic is back for 95. Ground ball to second base. Gets away from Alomar. He cannot recover. Ball was hit pretty hard, but Alomar normally gobbles those up. Yeah, it was just one of those things where, um, you know, you needed a, you know, uh, some breaks during the part of a game to uh, really get a uh, comeback going, and that was one of them. It happened in the ninth inning, and... Um, I think right after that, there was another controversial call at first, whether the ball was fair or foul. That's fair. Down the line into the corner. Albert Bell around 
second on his way to third. Murray held with a long single. The time runs are on. The winning run comes to the plate. Jimmy hit before me and uh, hit into a double play, but um, hustled down the line and beat it out, and that gave me an opportunity to come up with uh, two outs in the ninth. Now it's up to Paul Sorrento. It's eight to seven. I had a little adrenaline flowing because uh, it was against Paul and... Uh, the previous weekend, I think I pinch hit against him in Toronto. Same type of situation. It was late in the game. We were down by a run or two, and uh, I hit into a game-ending double play, and he shattered my bat in about four or five places. So um, I had a little extra adrenaline going, you know, a uh, little payback. And, um, you know, he just happened to get a ball up in the strike zone, and uh, I get the good part of the bat on it. Long drive, deep right field. Believe it. Amazing one pitch. The Indians win 9 to 8. The magic's back. The magic is back at Jacobs Field. Oh, wow. I think that was a real special day for us because I think it convinced us that, that, that we could score a lot of runs and score them quick. And that if we, you know, if we kept our wits about us and kept our goal in mind, that we could come back and get a job done. Manny's a guy that he's still living, you know, like he's a little kid, you know, he thinks he's a little kid, you're always joking around, but that's the way he is, you know, it's hard to change, you know, his mind from that, but, you know, the, if he keep hitting the way he's hitting, I don't want to mess it up. Ricky Henderson has hit more leadoff home runs than anyone, and against Dennis Martinez, he simply enhanced his legacy. Henderson's blast helped Oakland to a 3-0 lead in the first inning. They still led 3-1 at the end of six innings. But the Cleveland offense can strike oh so quickly, and in the seventh, it took just two pitches. The Indians need a base runner to bring the tying run to the plate. They're down by two. Baerga, line drive, right field, base hit. Well, there's your base runner right there, asking you shall receive. The fans begin to come to life looking for this late inning lightning at Jacobs Field. Drive deep left field, Henderson back, he'll look up, the ball is gone. Home run, Albert Bell, it's tied. It worked in the seventh, why not in the ninth? As the duo of Bayerga and Bell this time sought to break the tie. Bell with a line drive, left field, base hit. Pass Henderson, here comes Bayerga, around third. You know, sometimes you have to uh, uh, made the plays go through. You know, I had to hit the, the, the catcher. I hit uh, Steinberg pretty hard, but he never dropped the ball. The throw to the plate. He's out. Despite Bayerga's best efforts, the game remained tied. In the 12th inning, the man who opened the game with a home run scored the go-ahead run. And the A's turned their 4-3 lead over to a pitcher with more than 300 career saves. Uh, here's Dennis Eckersley, uh, a great, obviously a great relief pitcher, walks out and uh, you figure, you know, he figures, well, bang, 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 I'm going to close out this inning. Well, Eckersley is a guy that he comes, you know, he throws strike right away and I say, well, let me swim right away. Bayerga has five hits. Wow. Five hit ball game. That day, everything I hit it was a base hit and, and, you know, to start it up against Eckersley in that inning, that was more special. Bell pops it up. One out. Comey pops it up. It's two outs. The Indians are now down to their final out. Ramirez against Eckersley. I've got to feel like he felt intimidated there, even though he was facing a rookie. He got ahead of him with two strikes there, and then I think he went away from his pattern of Dennis Eckersley. He's got such good control. Steinbach moved outside on a couple pitches um, that weren't even close. You know, and he's got such impeccable control, you would think he would miss by three or four inches. Well, he really missed where he, he couldn't get Ramirez to chase the pitches. We've seen Manny, a very patient hitter. And he thought Manny would be going for a base hit. There was a man on second and two out. And so he thought, okay, he's going to look for the ball away and go for the base hit. So he came in with a fastball and tried to jam him. But he just didn't get it in enough. He didn't realize how quick this, this kid's bat is. That youthful exuberance came through, I think, as Manny see ball, hit ball. Comes inside, high fly ball, deep left field. Henderson looks up, the ball is gone, and the Indians win the game. 
uh, Eckersley's uh, reaction, he looked and you could just see him form the words, wow. And that's, I mean, I think that's, you know, that's the sort of sums up this team, wow. Manny Ramirez, a two out, two run home run in the bottom of the 12th inning. The sweep is complete. Um, a home run stroke when I when I did the uh, the home run hitting contest. Uh, I, I remember before then I, I wasn't real comfortable at the plate. I just didn't feel comfortable, and um, I knew there was a lot of pitches I was seeing that um, I felt like I could have hit them out of the ballpark, and they were just you know ground balls in the infield, double plays, and and then um, once I did the uh, home run contest, I felt like um, I found my home run stroke, and um, just pretty much. Um, I've been doing it uh, ever since the break. 5-3, the California Angels lead, and as expected, they will go to the big man, the all-time big man out of the bullpen. Well, it was amazing how it unfolded because they brought Lee Smith in and they had a, uh, a couple-run lead going into the ninth inning, and it started. It, it was just something like it was uh, meant to be. Another sellout tonight, 41,763, and I think almost all of them are still here. What it did, it jumped back and hit Snow. Now this is what the folks came to see. The Indians will get the tying run to the plate. The runner is going. Comey strikes out. One away. There was a line drive hit uh, to Gary Disarcina at short, and it just tipped off the top of his glove, and it fell out for a base hit. The tying runs are on. The winning run will come to the plate. Crowd getting on their feet. They sense it. They feel the magic is back. Trying to pull the Indians through again. They ended up walking Carlos Baerga, and as he's going to first base, he, he sensed something because he turns around and started screaming and pumped up Albert. I just said to Albert, come on, let's do it right here. You know, we, I want you to kill this guy. Bottom of the ninth, base is loaded. One man out. out. Nobody's left the ballpark. Everybody's still here. The all-time save leader against <laughs> the Indians' cleanup battle. This is baseball at its finest. In that situation there, uh, you know, I had a pretty good idea. I mean, you know, Lee Smith just going to go right after you. Strike one call. And that's what he's done um, so far in his career to be the all-time save leader. Out of play right side. The first couple of pitches, I mean, he just he blew some cheese by there. It kind of took me by surprise. And, um, you know, he threw a couple balls. And, and I was looking for another um, fastball by him. And, you know, he got a slider out over the plate. Uh, I think it was a little bit higher than he wanted to and uh, just stayed back and, and, and hit it straight away center field. Line to center field. Back is Edmonds to the warning track to the wall. It's gone. A grand slam home run. The magic continues. The Indians win. Oh. Look at this place. Unbelievable. on Sunday, tonight, Smith. Lee Smith. Albert, let me ask you, what is it about this place, these fans, this stadium, this season that inspires nights like tonight? There's got to be a certain feeling that everybody down there has. We're very confident, you know, playing at our home ballpark. Uh, it's a uh, new stadium. Uh, we got sellout crowds. Uh, fans are going crazy, but I'm not real thrilled about the idea of uh, coming from behind all the time. <laughs> there you go. And it was almost like you could see it happening, you know. As soon as they got one guy on base, the confidence started to build and pick up, and it's, it's, that's how it's been. The 95 Indians. Hats off to a team that proved it is never over till it's over. I have never seen the type of things that uh, I've seen from this club in 27 years. I haven't seen these types of finishes. One or two a year uh, is usually the norm for most clubs where they have a late inning dramatic home run. It, it just seems to happen over and over again for this ball club. I uh, told Dick Jacobs that uh, this is something that doesn't happen all the time and his response to me is, well, I'm getting used to it. It has been a magical year at Jacobs Field and everyone has their favorite magic moment. I think the one Sorrento hit against the Blue Jays. I think it's a blessing. It's a blessing from the Lord. By far, that was the biggest home run all year when he hit that. But the one that really stands out for me was uh, 
uh, the two-run homer that Manny hit uh, with two out and two strikes off Dennis Eckersley. This is a team of destiny. There's no question about it. I think the most dramatic uh, last second victory uh, was when uh, Albert Bell hit the Grand Slam home run off Lee Smith. On the highlight reels, that ball, ball right by me, and I'm the white cameraman jumping up and down, so I really enjoyed that one. Well, you're down in the, in the ninth inning, here comes Albert Bell and bang, Grand Slam home run to center field. Uh, that was about as dramatic as you can get. I definitely think, you know, something special about this place, that they're hitting so well, and that they're doing so good this year. Jacob Field is a magical place.